Um, Adriana Joachimescu is my name. And yes, by the end of today, you will get a test. You'll have to either pronounce it correctly or spell it. And you have choices, either mine or Dr. Oishiku's, okay? So, so that's not too bad, because I think his is a lot easier than mine. So, um, so um, I am at uh, Emory University here in Atlanta. I'm very fortunate to be part of this um, Emory Pituitary Center. And I would like to thank um, the CSRF for inviting me today. It is a pleasure um, to speak here. And I would like to welcome everybody. I see a lot of uh, faces that I know, and I'm glad um, you know my pa some of my patients are here. But also to all of you who have traveled, I've seen you know from Alabama, from North Carolina, I've seen Massachusetts, and so forth. Welcome to Atlanta. I hope we had a, you know we we could have had a better weather this weekend, but you know we're here anyway today. So I have the. Um, task of um, starting out and um, you know introducing everybody to Cushing's and I know everybody here has knowledge about Cushing's um, and also I would like to talk a little bit about the diagnostic tests. First let's do right by the hormone called cortisol which is produced by the two glands situated on top of each kidneys, adrenal glands. Normal cortisol levels are essential for life, and they are essential um, since early uh, life. They have a very significant role in growth and sexual development. They maintain normal blood pressure, blood glucose, body temperature. Um, they um, help us um, having a good uh, immune response and response to acute illness and stress. And you know, we, we could talk for an hour just about this. So. Let's just start with, with this in mind. However, when there is too much cortisol, especially if the excess state persists for a long period of time, for months or years, the consequences of too much cortisol can become devastating. And there are receptors for cortisol. This is like the lock where you introduce the key. There are receptors everywhere in the body. So if you go down to, to this list, you know, there are, there are definitely changes in the way the person looks. These changes may take place gradually. So it might be a while until someone figures out, just like, you know, the ladies before me had already mentioned, or they can, they can occur abruptly, but that's rare. So the main changes in appearance are related to face becoming round, and um, the abdomen becoming larger, or also accumulation of um, some fat behind the neck, something that some call buffalo hump, and um, you know, in the in the um, um, supraclavicular fossae right here. So these changes occur over time. Um, there are also receptors for cortisol in the brain, and uh, many patients with Cushing syndrome notice, or perhaps their spouses, their families, um, that there are changes in personality and behavior, more sad, more irritable, they cannot sleep well, um, mood swings, um, and um, memory and focus issues. Um, we've talked about the, the moon faces. Um, the bones are definitely affected. The patients may, may have fractures or what we call osteoporosis. Um, the heart is affected um, by high levels of cortisol. These will lead to elevated blood pressure that eventually will put some strain on the heart if untreated. Um, the adrenal glands, of course, are really the players here, but Sometimes they are just playing a game because they are being told to do so. So if you scan the adrenal glands, it just depends what kind of Cushing's you're dealing with. You may find a tumor, you may find some nodules, or you may just find that they are slightly enlarged, or they may look normal. The skin, there are several um, different skin abnormalities that occur, and not everybody will get all the skin problems but the skin gets more uh, thin, it wrinkles easily, it bruises easily, the wound healing is um, impaired, and new stretch marks occur. Those that you know are not the old stretch marks that the woman had ever since she gave birth, they are more deep, they are discolored, red um, or purple in color. 
In women, um, the ovaries are blocked most of the time and the cortisol levels are high for a while. Um, there are no periods. In both genders, there are issues with fertility and sexual function. Um, and high blood pressure and high blood glucose, also called diabetes mellitus, um, are part of this picture. Again, not in everybody and may not be the case from the beginning. If this condition occurs in kids, they may end up shorter than what would have been expected from their parents. So what are the causes of excess cortisol? And um, I have to back off a little bit, just a little bit, and move away from the tumors, because the most frequent cause of too much steroid effect in the body is actually exogenous steroid administration or glucocorticoid administration. If the patient is treated for prednisone for long periods of time for a different condition that cannot be otherwise controlled, they can develop exactly all the problems that I showed you on the slide before. Also, people don't usually pay too much attention to these things, but whenever a patient gets injections in their joints for one reason or another, especially every three to six months, you know, they should know what they are getting, because sometimes there is a powerful glucocorticosteroid called triamcinolone in there, that if, if it's administered often, it may also cause the problems of too much cortisol in the system, too much, not cortisol, but too much steroid in the system. The second category of too much glucocorticoid has to do with reactive production of cortisol from the body. So the adrenal glands are turned on by something, they produce a lot of cortisol, but this is not a tumoral situation. And finally, the tumors. So let's start with this um, reactive hypercortisolemia. It's reactive to something. The cortisol goes up because of something else. Severe obesity may cause elevation of the cortisol levels. Mood disorders that are, are not controlled, and you see the list there. Chronic alcoholism. Poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. Untreated obstructive sleep apnea. So by now, I think I must have had some of you confused because I told you that if you have Cushing's from a tumor, you may develop diabetes mellitus, but um, I'm also telling you on this slide that if you have uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, which is an epidemic in today's society, you may have co high cortisol levels. So yes, we are dealing in our offices with the situation of the chicken or the egg, and we have to um, figure it out in order to offer the patient the best treatment. But when we're talking about Cushing syndrome, we have to un understand the regulation that is very exquisite, and we call this the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Basically what happens is the hypothalamus um, releases a hormone um, called um, CRH that turns on the pituitary. So the pituitary is the master gland of the body, but it's subject to control itself. And then the pituitary gland makes ACTH, which in turns, turns uh, which in turn um, tells the cortisol what to do, and the cortisol is secreted by the two adrenal glands. And you see those um, arrows with a minus next to them. These are called feedback loop loops. So for example, if there is too much cortisol produced by the adrenal gland for a reason or another, then both the hypothalamus and the pituitary are sensing that and are turning down their production of CRH and ACTH. And this is pretty much the basis of our testing. Of, and that's how we understand the Cushing's, and that's how we're trying to figure it out by, by trying to understand the, the physiology. So most of the time, seven or eight cases out of 10, um, Cushing syndrome is called by the pituitary gland tumors. ACTH secreting pituitary tumors. This is called Cushing's disease. So again, it's another subject for confusion, even for my medical students and residents. Why well, do you have a disease and a syndrome? So, you know, d d patients with Cushing's disease represent about 70% of patients with Cushing's syndrome. Um, 
This is, again, a tumor, usually small, on the pituitary gland that produces ACTH in an independent, unregulated fashion. The second most common cause of Cushing syndrome uh, consists of adrenal gland tumors. So, you know, about um, 15 to 20 percent of patients with Cushing syndrome have this. Now, this situation has to do with, an, with a nodule on the adrenal gland that produces too much cortisol independent of the pituitary control. So it's not the pituitary to be at fault here. And finally, we have something called ectopic ACTH production. So there is an excess state of ACTH, and this turns on the cortisol and the adrenal glands, but it's not a pituitary source. And most of the time, when we find it, it's in the lung, but could be thymus, pancreas, other locations. The only good thing about Cushing syndrome is that it's rare. Um, it's interesting if you look at the literature on how frequent this is. It seems to be changing. It seems to, you know, we, we seem to see a little more than what the textbook um, written 10 years ago are saying. Um, I would say 10 to 15 cases per million per year, new diagnosis, um, if you look at all the causes that I just told you about. Women are certainly more affected than men. At least this applies at least for the pituitary Cushing. And then uh, ages 20 to 50 seem to be affected more frequently, but as I told you, kids are, unfortunately can get it too. So the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. By now, I think I've made a, a sufficient introduction for you to understand that this is the challenge of the endocrinologist. Um, and um, the patient faces a long winding road. And you know, the most important thing to get to the end of this road where the answer is, and hopefully the answer will lead to a solution, is to work well with your doctors. There is chemistry there, there is trust, and um, you know there is a sense of patience, and you, you know from the beginning that you're not going to know tomorrow what's going on. The diagnosis relies on multiple tests that should be ideally interpreted by an endocrinologist who sees this on a regular basis. Um, the diagnosis relies on multiple blood collections, 24-hour urine, urine collections, and even the saliva collection is, is done today. We endocrinologists like to do this dynamic endocrine te uh, testing. You've seen those loops, those regulation loops. We try to stimulate or inhibit one part or, or the other of the axis in order to see how, how they react. And also imaging studies um, are helpful here. But again, the endocrinologists like to do imaging after the uh, blood work or the urine or the dynamic testing suggested one place or another. If we're going to start image the whole body from the day one, we're going to find several different things, especially in, their, in, in patients in their um, 40s and 50s. And we might not know where to start first because some of them might be just incidentally there and not harmful. It is important for your doctor to be familiar with this because, um, for example, our society today is an overweight society. This is more the rule than the exception to the rule. So, you know, we want to be careful about, you know, testing everybody with, who is overweight. Well, this might not be a good enough yield. Um, why to use a certain test versus the other? We have so many choices. What kind of assays are we using? Are we familiar with the lab we're working with? Have they just changed their, their assay and so forth? And then we have to be careful when we interpret. Um, I'm sure all of you have been in an endocrinologist office and they've told you, and not necessarily about the cortisol, perhaps about the TSH or the PTH, and they said, yeah, your blood work is slightly abnormal, but this, is, this falls in that gray area. Don't you worry, we're gonna recheck it. Right? You know, so we do have all these gray areas in endocrinology. We, we work with hormones that are present in very small amount in the bloodstream, and, and sometimes we have to repeat and figure out what a level that is slightly different than normal actually means. And then we have this false positive and false negative result. So a test may suggest something, and in fact, um, that diagnosis is not there. So 
all our tests have these caveats. It's very important to do them in the right order. Um, first, you want to establish the diagnosis. Does the patient who sits here with you really have uh, Cushing syndrome, or is it a situation where something else is going on? You know, very stressed at work, or a family issue, or you know, sleep apnea that hasn't been diagnosed and is very uncontrolled. Um, you know, could we fix that first? With what is going on? So first, establishing the diagnosis, and then. If the diagnosis is confirmed, then we have to see where the problem is. The red flags for any endocrinologist to, to screen for Cushing syndrome are abnormal weight gain and central fat distribution in the areas that, that I showed you before, skin changes like easy bruising, deep and discolored stretch marks that are new for the patient, opportunistic infections, the kind that, you know, a person who's always kind of been okay and was not born with an immune deficiency or does not have um, HIV shouldn't develop a, you know, widespread fungal infection, for example, and so forth. So if those have started to happen in a person who's now 30 and has been otherwise healthy, something serious is going on. Excess hair in women, now careful, because some women do have a state of um, a little bit, you know, hair in places where most women wouldn't like it. And that could be like a family thing um, or a Mediterranean heritage, or it could be um, PCOS, you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is so frequent. But if this is something new that has become more bothersome, I'm definitely worth looking into. And then muscle wasting. If, if there is decrease in muscle strength, the muscles are becoming thinner, um, that is certainly an alarm sign. We do test patients with uncontrolled um, diabetes for, for Cushing syndrome. Not always. We have to have, because diabetes, again, is so widespread today. Um, and about 3 to 5% of patients with, um, with type 2 diabetes actually have Cushing syndrome. But in presence of additional clinical clues, this is certainly warranted. Um, young women or men who break their bones, there shouldn't be any, um, any kind of, um, um, we, we shouldn't just wait on that. We should do several tests and, and checking the cortisol is part of that. And then adrenal tumors discovered incidentally. Um, that's, that's another situation when we do text, check for Cushing's presence. So we have three types of screening tests today, a 24-hour urine-free cortisol, low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, and bedtime salivary cortisol. With regards to the first one, the urine-free cortisol, um, it is useful because cortisol is excreted by the kidneys. Assays are different, so don't be surprised if, if your cortisol, the same level, reads normal for one lab and reads slightly higher for the other. So repeating is always a good idea. Two abnormal tests are required for the diagnosis, at least based on the current endocrine society criteria. And there are some caveats. I mean, with our testing, there are always caveats. A situation of early Cushing that is just mild may not be detected by this test. On the other um, hand, you might have patients who don't have tumors and are just going through an episode of uncontrolled depression, and they can have slightly elevated urine-free cortisol levels. If the, if the urine that is collected is not the 24-hour urine, if the collection is incomplete, um, or if the patient drinks a lot of water, you know, you've, you've got you know, five, six liters, a couple of jugs that they bring back to the lab. That's not going to be um, as informative. And then um, patient with kidney disease, we have stages for this, th stage three or, or more severe. Um, really, this test is not very helpful for them. How about the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test? So dexamethasone is a powerful steroid. So if you think back at my graph where a steroid would inhibit the hypothalamus and the pituitary, this is pretty much the concept behind this test. You give a steroid, you expect the ACTH to do what should should do, you know, get the level, um, get a lower level of cortisol as a result of less ACTH stimulation. I've only put this number here, normal results 1.8 or less, to make a point. Several years ago, our cutoff was 5. 
and um, um, you know we've changed the cutoff because we wa- we don't want to miss anybody with with Cushing's. This is a very important disease with devastating consequences if not diagnosed in time. So um, we wanted to capture more Cushing's um, patients by lowering the threshold. So a negative test in most cases rules out the disease. Most. Um, But renal and and liver failure may may be an exception to this. But what we've done by changing the cutoff, we've now created room for false positive results, meaning, uh, you know, perhaps your cortisol is free after the test, but this may be normal for you. So we have to deal with this 30 to 40 percent abnormal results that do not truly um, reflect Cushing, and be careful about that. Um, and we can also um, have false positive results because of some drugs that are concomitantly taken in women who take oral contraceptives or who are pregnant. And each one of us will absorb dexamethasone differently. I mean, we give the same dose to everybody, hoping, you know, everybody will, will be below 1.8. It doesn't quite work like that. Bedtime salivary cortisol, this has certainly revolutionized us our way uh, of looking at Cushing's. As you see here in this graph, the cortisol, these are plasma levels, um, the cortisol is at its lowest somewhere between you know, 11 p.m. and early morning. And then it starts increasing and um, um, you have the first serious peak surge of cortisol um, around 6 to 9 a.m. And then there are some up and down there, and there is a second um, peak later in the day. But truly the best time to check the cortisol is when it's supposed to be at its lowest, also called nadir. So in the past, we would admit patients to the hospital, put a line in, and then try to see what the cortisol is at midnight. Fortunately, we don't have to do that anymore because we have the salivary cortisol. and. Um, um, no, we you now understand why that kit tells you to to use it close to bedtime. Two abnormal levels are required for diagnosis. Um, what this means, sensitivity and specificity are very good. Means that it's a test that is good to rule in to find the patients with Cushing's, but also rule out. So if you have a normal test, that's fairly reassuring that at this time your your Cushing is not active. Like with any test, there are caveats. Um, there are these, these salivary cortisol levels haven't been tested sufficiently in patients who are 70 years of age or older. So we might see a cortisol level that is higher in that group, and we don't quite know what to do with it because we don't have a database to look that far. Um, some hypertensive patients, some patients with depression may have elevated salivary cortisol levels. But once we've made the diagnosis, once we have two screening tests, two out of the three I've told you that suggest um, Cushing syndrome, we can move on and try to find a problem. And the endocrinologist will will ask herself, is this an ACTH dependent or independent problem? ACTH is the hormone that normally secreted by the pituitary. So um, the triangles here in the, in the left upper part um, represent mostly patients with pituitary Cushing. Uh, there are two open triangles, those had uh, lung tumors. And as you see, their ACTH levels are significantly higher compared to the circles. And the circles here represent patients with adrenal tumors. In, in their case, the ACTH is almost always low, lower than normal. So it's a very helpful test. So once we figure out where the ACTH is, we move on to imaging studies. If it's ACTH dependent, the first place to look is the pituitary gland because you know this is where mm, statistically the problem is going to be. And um, in our own MRI cohort and in previous uh, studies that were published, the most frequent abnormality in patients with Cushing's disease is a microadenoma, a tumor that is uh, one centimeter or or less. Um, 20% of patients with Cushing's have completely normal MRI scans, and that's where the problem originates, and it's still completely normal. And then 15% or, or 20 also, we have macroadenoma, so, so um, slightly larger abnormality. It's one centimeter or larger. Now, keep in mind that if you do an MRI in a general healthy population, you might find a small pituitary abnormality in about 15% of them. 
So that's where we're coming back to the to the um, order of tests. If you start with an MRI of the pituitary gland and you found something, you still have to be very careful at figuring out whether the two are related before you ask um, a neurosurgeon to remove it. And then in the ACTH independent situations, those where the ACTH was low, then the adrenal glands need to be imaged and CAT scan is usually our first step. We are not done yet because even though we have an ACTH secreting tumor with a revealing MRI or perhaps non-revealing MRI, we still haven't ruled out the other possibility of a tumor located in the lung or thymus, ectopic ACTH production. Now those are rare, right? But um, would you take the risk of, of having neurosurgery without ruling out that um, few percentages. Um, so um, many of our patients end up having inferior petrosal sinus sampling, and uh, we calculate something called a gradient, central to periphery gradient. It's a, it's a more, um, it's, it's, it's a test that in, it's invasive. It does involve a catheter uh, pushed up through the groin all the way up to the left and the right of the pituitary gland. And then there is this ratio that we calculate by drawing blood from the a peripheral vein and from the petrosal sinus sampling. But this is very helpful with um, identifying those few patients with ectopic Cushing's where there will be no gradient. I've put this here um, just to make a point. I see a lot of patients, not a lot, but several patients in my clinic who have had already a petrosal sinus sampling that showed a gradient. And they've come to us and they say, we're ready to go. We, we have uh, we have Cushing's disease, my MRI is unrevealing, or reveal something, and this is where the problem is. And I look at their testing that they've done before the petrosal sinus sampling, and I do not see the grounds for ordering the petrosal sinus sampling. I do not see evidence for convincing evidence for Cushing. Furthermore, I don't see evidence for active Cushing on those weeks that led to the test, because Cushing sometimes can can go up and down in terms of their activity. And I'm very concerned about that. And um, you know, this is something, this is research that showed how, um, how, what the overlap is between patients with true Cushing's disease, pseudo-Cushing, also called reactive hypercortisolemia today, and normal volunteers. So you cannot rely on this test as a, you know, in, as a method to make the diagnosis. This is something you pursue afterwards when you're convinced of the diagnosis, or you may end up treating someone, and then the tumor is not found, and the patient is in the same place as they were before surgery. That's not optimal. For ectopic Cushing, the imaging usually starts with CAT scan of the lung, but you know we do extensive testing if we don't find it, and we repeat it periodically every uh, few months or so if it's negative. So for this first um, talk um, of the day, um, I would like to close by saying that the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome takes time, patience, and extensive testing. If the diagnosis is in doubt, which you know will happen many times, at least in the beginning, keep in touch with your doctor um, regarding any health changes. Go back to those appointments or find another doctor to give you a second opinion. If there is a disease where, um, where a second or a third opinion are, are, um, is welcome, Cushing is the right one. So I'll, um, thank you again. I'll, I'll talk to you later.